Thank you to Kevin Cheng, Moose, Panzerway, Pavtu, Pushy Shuket, Zachary Crumroy, and Zed Liu for making this channel financially viable. Also, thank you to John Smith for suggesting this video topic. In June 2022, the decades-long whiskey war between the Canadian and Danish governments came to an end. It wasn't really a war, just a territorial dispute, but it's pretty famous for the fact that both sides would put up their national flags, fold the other side's flag, and leave them a bottle of alcohol. I'll cover what led up to the whiskey war, why it lasted for so long, the influence of other governments in the area slightly more generally, like the Chinese government, and I'll end with a little opinion piece on how I think the popular image of the whiskey war serves a useful purpose for the Canadian and Danish governments. The land being disputed in the whiskey war was essentially just a huge rock called Hans Island, right in the middle of the Nares Strait between Canada and Greenland, which is an autonomous part of Denmark. As one author describes Hans Island and the dispute itself, does it contain resources? No, as the island is a rock with no vegetation. Is there a historical interest based on human inhabitation? No, as humans have never lived on the island. Would possessing the island affect either country's coastal boundaries? No, as Canada and Denmark divided up all available coastal territory around the island. Would it affect international law? No, it would not have implications under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, Articles 55-75, to which establish the area and rules of exclusive economic zones 200 nautical miles from the baselines from which the breadth of the territorial sea is measured. The Canadian government's legal basis for its claims was the British Adjacent Territories Order of 1880, whereby all the British government's Arctic lands were given to the Canadian government. For the Danish government, meanwhile, there is the Eastern Greenland case of 1933. This was a dispute at the Permanent Court of International Justice, the PCIJ, where the Danish government, who controlled some land and settlements on Greenland, claimed that they owned the entire island. The Danish government supported their claim by presenting letters from other governments to them about Greenland since 1915, and argued that Danish people and monarchs had long made decisions regarding Greenland, and that Danish people had been on the island since the Middle Ages, and so sovereignty of the entire place should be theirs. The Norwegian government, however, claimed that they couldn't own the whole of Greenland, on account of the fact that they only had any real presence in a tiny bit of it, and that the letters presented to the court actually supported that argument. I'll explain this more in a minute. The PCIJ, though, agreed with the Danish government, arguing that, while Danish people's presence on the island was very limited, the North Pole was so empty of people that it didn't need much of a presence at all for a government to be able to claim that they owned part of it. The native people were not, as far as I can tell, given a voice at the court, because this was the 1930s, so they weren't really even seen as people due to contemporary white supremacist attitudes. The court's decision led to a new legal precedent in territorial dispute cases, where sovereignty issues could be judged on a more case-by-case -case basis, depending on the circumstances of the territory. To return to the Danish government's historical claims about the letters, these were written to various other governments between 1915 and 1921, with the purpose of gaining recognition for Danish government rule across the whole of Greenland, and they started because of some concerns from the US government. So, in 1915, during the First World War, the German government was primarily fighting a two-front war in Europe, the British and French governments to their west, and the Russian monarchy to their east. The British government had launched a naval blockade of Germany to starve out the country, both economically and food-wise, at the start of the war in 1914. Denmark was a potential extra source of food, and a way to break the blockade for the German government, and a potential way to tighten the blockade and threaten northern Germany for the British government, while for both it offered the potential to gain more control of the Baltic Sea. Both sides feared that the other might try to invade Denmark, the government of which had declared neutrality. The US government, also neutral, similarly feared a German government invasion of Denmark, because then that would leave the German government in control of the Danish West Indies, which they could turn into a naval base and threaten US government interests in the Caribbean, or even the US mainland itself, 
The US government's plan in 1915 was to buy the Danish government's colony, and the Danish government replied that they were open to the idea on the condition that the US government recognise Danish government sovereignty over all Greenland. The US government had its own territorial claims to parts of northern Greenland, though, I suppose seeing the Caribbean is more important, the Danish government's condition was agreed to, and the US government ended up buying the Danish West Indies. Today, they're known as the US Virgin Islands. Anyway, the Danish government claimed total sovereignty over all of Greenland. They included Hans Island in this. The island itself was, so I've read, named by an American explorer called Charles Francis Hall, who gave it the name it has after his Greenlandic guide, Hans Hendrik. To return to the Canadian government, in addition to claiming territories through the 1880 decision I mentioned earlier, they also staked their claim to Arctic lands through other methods. One of these, allegedly, was the High Arctic Relocations Program in the 1950s. The Canadian government promised many poor Inuit citizens a better life in the most northern parts of the country, but many of those families who went were forcibly separated, very little or no equipment was given to them when they arrived, and previous government promises that people could leave after two years if they wanted were never honoured. As one article relates, Inuit felt they had little choice but to move, and recounted the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples going house to house, looking for volunteers, using an interpreter to translate their request into unilingual Inuit. Inuit felt there was an ulterior motive to the relocations, such as the protection of Canadian sovereignty, while government officials maintained the move was to improve the quality of life of the Inuit of Inukjuak. In March 2006, the federal government established a reconciliation agreement, creating a $10 million trust fund for relocated individuals and their families. For many, this was a double-edged sword. The government refused to accompany the settlement with an apology. The granddaughter of one of those sent to the area would later say, We were basically human flagpoles, so the Canadian government could assert sovereignty over the high Arctic. The actual dispute over Hans Island itself would begin in 1973. In the 1970s, two things happened. The first was that oil and gas exploration missions began to be launched off the coast of Greenland. The second is that the Danish and Canadian governments began discussing where to draw the official boundary between their Arctic territories. In 1973, both sides came to an agreement of where to draw the line dividing who owned what for the purpose of each party's exploration and exploitation of the natural resources. But neither side could come to an agreement about Hans Island, because both sides claimed it was theirs. Neither government had any documents which they could use to show the island belonged to them, because it's literally just a huge rock, and because they didn't come to an agreement, they left an 857 metre gap in the borderline where Hans Island was. Both sides, however, would keep on trying to assert their right to own the island. In 1981 and 1983, the Canadian Energy Corporation, Dome Petroleum, launched some research trips to Hans Island, as it was suggested that there were a lot of oil resources in the area. When the Danish government heard about this, they sent their own expedition to the island to assert their own sovereignty over it. In 1984, the Danish Minister for Greenlandic Affairs flew to Hans Island, planted a Danish flag on it, left a note saying, Welcome to the Danish island, and then left a bottle of alcohol at the base of the flag. Soon enough, the Canadian government would dispatch its own counter-expedition to replace the Danish flag with the Canadian flag, and left their own bottle of alcohol in return. This is why it's known as the Whiskey War. This happened numerous times after 1984, and in 2005 the Canadian military also built an Inuksuk on their visit. Things really stepped up in 2005 when the Canadian Defence Minister, Bill Graham, visited the island. By this time, according to The Guardian, both sides were taking out Google ads to assert their sovereignty over Hans Island, and when Graham visited, he declared that the island had always been Canadian government territory. The Danish government declared Graham's move was akin to an occupation, that Hans Island is our island, and would prepare another military expedition to visit it. Reportedly, in Canada, this heating up of tensions led some to call for a boycott of Danish pastries. <laughs> 
In September 2005, both sides agreed to a truce, and a return to the status quo of leaving the island's fate ambiguous. This whole situation seems very silly, but there's a bunch of different reasons that both governments were so committed to staking their claim to Han's island. Most of these reasons can be summed up as defence, profit, and national pride. As one article relates from the Canadian government perspective, the campaign for Han's Island appears to be part of a broader effort to make sure the world knows that the Arctic archipelago is Canadian territory, and that global warming means that in the not-so-distant future, the fabled and usually ice-bound Northwest Passage would become a major shipping route between Asia and Europe. Melting ice, which would be catastrophic for the people and wildlife of the Arctic, could also make it more economically viable to look for undersea resources like oil and gas. The Canadian government is hoping that increased activity in the area will protect its sovereignty. Some Canadian experts worry that Canada is risking too much in the fight for such a tiny island so far north of any potential shipping routes. They say if Canada loses Hans Island, it will weaken its case on the Northwest Passage, and other, more crucial questions of Arctic sovereignty. The oil and gas resources around Greenland are estimated to be huge. One survey announced in 2008 that 90 billion barrels of oil, 1,669 trillion cubic feet of natural gas, and 44 billion barrels of natural gas liquids may remain to be found in the Arctic of which approximately 84% is expected to occur in offshore areas. However, there are also environmental concerns about any oil resources in the region, and the Canadian government would actually limit exploration licences in line with those concerns in 2016. The Greenlandic government, on the other hand, saw things differently, regarding those natural resources as a valuable asset, and so has repeatedly encouraged more drilling, while the Canadian government has been more hesitant. Environmentalist and indigenous groups have repeatedly protested against the financial exploitation and destruction of the region. I want to look more closely at the national security side of things. As one paper explains, there has been a lot of securitization surrounding the Hans Island dispute. That being where governments see certain events or issues as threats or not, and whether they build them up into one. In this case, the alleged threat can mostly be summed up as a threat to the notion of national borders and sovereignty, especially for the Canadian government. If the Canadian government didn't get Hans Island, then it put their claims to sovereignty in other parts of the Arctic at risk. In 2006, a Conservative government came to power, led by the new Prime Minister Stephen Harper. The new government took their Arctic sovereignty claims very seriously, and published a policy outline, the Northern Strategy, calling the region our North, our heritage, our future. To relate how one paper explained the situation, the new government argued that ensuring Canada claimed the maximum extent of its continental shelf was a key priority. Canada and Denmark spent more than seven years mapping shelves, and Canada was ready to make its claim, which scientists determined did not include the North Pole. However, in December 2013, the media reported that the government of Stephen Harper ordered scientists to complete more surveys and prepare a claim that included the North Pole. In essence, the Harper government ordered scientists to find a way to include the North Pole in Canada's claims, even though the evidence did not support this conclusion. This case represents an instance of securitization, taking a scientific issue and making it political by forcing scientists to make an ambitious claim to bolster sovereignty. It is impossible to document the full story of what transpired behind the scenes as the Harper government was careful to keep it out of the public domain. According to reports, at least, one of the reasons that Harper had the view he did about the Arctic comes from the fact that many prominent Canadian symbols or government policies, such as healthcare, being the UN, and even the flag and national anthem, were created by the Liberal, and not Conservative, party. Allegedly, he wanted to emphasise patriotic symbols which weren't necessarily associated with the Liberal Party, such as the military, the mounted police, the War of 1812, and the Arctic. The government moved quickly to increase its presence in the region, constructing new ice-breaking ships, a new port, and underwater listening posts. Another aspect of sovereignty is the question of the free movement of indigenous people. 
Historically, the various Inuit nations moved freely across the Arctic region until European governments began colonising the area, constructing their own borders and limiting the freedom of indigenous people, many of whom would be subject to genocidal policies in the colonies and nation-states imposed upon them. Allowing free movement for Inuit people in the modern day would, as one academic argued, send an important signal that the heritage of the Inuit has a place in modern day Canada and Denmark, and that the historical territory of the indigenous peoples has a place in the modern world. There is a practical argument as well. Northern communities in Canada lack passport processing, and so obtaining a passport can be onerous, especially for isolated communities. A significant number of Inuit, especially poor Inuit, do not currently possess a passport. However, free movement never came to pass, in spite of the Canadian and Danish governments using the Inuit people as a basis for their claims to Arctic lands generally, and Huns Island specifically. In the Canadian government's 2009 Northern Strategy, it claims that Canada's Arctic sovereignty is long-standing, well-established, and based on historic title, founded in part on the presence of Inuit and other Aboriginal peoples since time immemorial. While the Danish government claimed sovereignty over Hans Island by stating that Hans Hendrik, the Greenlandic guide I mentioned earlier, discovered the island, and that Greenlandic Inuit people may have used the island in the past. That Canadian government policy outline contains surprisingly militaristic language. Exercising our sovereignty includes maintaining a strong presence in the North, enhancing our stewardship of the region, defining our domain and advancing our knowledge of the region. The Government of Canada is firmly asserting its presence in the North, ensuring we have the capability and capacity to protect and patrol the land, sea and sky in our sovereign Arctic territory. We are putting more boots on the Arctic tundra, more ships in the icy water, and a better eye in the sky. The Whiskey War itself has often been waged, for lack of a better term, by the Canadian and Danish militaries, planting their flags and leaving alcoholic presents. This, however, actually caused another problem with the Huns Island dispute. You might be wondering why the International Court of Justice, the ICJ, can't decide on the case similarly to the 1933 court case. Well, multiple reasons and I'll tie in the military point in a minute. According to one article I read, the ICJ, if it were to arbitrate over who gets Hans Island, would first look at treaties about the Greenlandic-Canadian border. But the only one that exists is the 1973 treaty, where the two sides left an 850 metre gap where the island is. In other words, there's no historic precedent for the court to follow to give the island to either government. There was the 1880 transferal of lands from the British government to the Canadian government, but there's no indication that Hans Island specifically was included in that. Due to this lack of historical precedent, the court would have to follow the same line of argument as the PCIJ in 1933, that whoever had effective occupation of Hans Island should be granted sovereignty over it. With Hans Island particularly, establishing effective occupation in terms of human settlement isn't really an option because it's just a huge rock. Using the precedent of the 1933 case, effective occupation needn't necessarily be as rigid in the North Pole as in other places, but literally nothing had been done historically with Hans Island to even merit the most basic claims to sovereignty. Nothing, that is, except various flag-planting, alcohol-leaving expeditions undertaken, often, though by no means exclusively, by military units. If this were the basis upon which the Whiskey War was settled, then it would be a legal confirmation that governments can essentially take any uninhabited lands they want if only they put enough troops on it and raise their national flag. Many governments have claims to lands in the Arctic for numerous reasons, such as security and future trade, and this could precipitate a rush where they send expedition after expedition to take as much as possible, confident that it would be legally sound. The Russian government has claimed lands which are also claimed by the Danish government, while the US government, as one paper explains, makes frequent naval forays to the Arctic and could potentially use these trips as a basis for sovereignty claims. If things got really out of hand, it could even lead to a confrontation as the Arctic becomes more militarised, or at least has more of a military presence in it. <laughs> 
In 2008, the Canadian, Danish, Norwegian, Russian, and US governments all held a conference in Greenland, where they agreed that the Arctic status quo was completely fine as it was, and it didn't need to change. This is kind of a weird thing to have an agreement on, but as one academic paper explains, it's because there was perceived to be a threat against that status quo. Part of the reason was climate change melting the Arctic ice. While this would have been catastrophic for people and wildlife, it would also be an opportunity for business people to make money by accessing newly ice-free waterways with newly accessible mountains of natural resources. Whichever government controls the waterway will be able to profit from the huge influx of trade which will follow, in the same way that the Egyptian government makes billions of dollars from people transiting the Suez Canal. The Canadian and Danish governments would both want the chance to be the ones profiting from this, but so would other governments, which could upset the Arctic status quo. The second reason was that a Russian government expedition planted a flag at the North Pole. One Canadian government official related the reaction to this as, Last October 2007, there was a meeting of legal advisers in Oslo, which included an American, a Canadian, and I don't know who all was in the room, but it was certainly more than the five who were in Greenland. Then Denmark decided they wanted to take this to the ministerial level, so they invited the five states which actually border on the Arctic Ocean, and they drafted a declaration, which, quite frankly, said the same things that officials had already agreed to, which was that the Arctic is an ocean, and there is a law of the sea convention which manages all aspects of the Arctic. There is simply no comparison between the Arctic and the Antarctic. I think it was a very wise idea to get ahead of the issue, just simply do a Google search on the Russian flag on the North Pole last summer, and you'll see in the first instance there's this enormous wave. Here they come, Russians over the top. What was being done in Greenland is that the five countries at the level of their foreign ministers were standing up and saying, no, we've got a regime here, cool your jets. There's not going to be any new regime called the Arctic Littoral States or anything like that. This is where we have to start talking about Greenlandic independence. In 1940, Denmark was invaded and occupied by the German government, and the exiled Danish government agreed to leave the protection of Greenland, which it owned as a colony, to the US government. Much like Iceland, also kind of part of Denmark at the time and invaded by the British government in 1940, Greenland was very geographically useful for the Allied governments, because it meant they could extend their air power further out to sea to protect supply convoys in the Battle of the Atlantic, many of which were being destroyed by German government submarines. The US government would build multiple airfields on Greenland, some of which are still in use today, or, like Toole Air Force Base, are actually still owned by the US government. During this time, local government in Greenland had the near total independence to run its own affairs, and in the 1950s, when Greenland was brought back under Danish government control, this time it was as a province rather than as a colony, meaning it got representation in the Danish parliament. The Danish government granted home rule to Greenland's government in 1979, and in 2009, self-rule. The Greenlandic government was essentially made a near fully sovereign part of Denmark. There were many, at least as many as 64%, as per a 2016 poll, who wanted it to become a fully independent nation. One issue, however, is that the Greenlandic economy is heavily reliant on money from the Danish government. About two-thirds of the GDP, as per one 2008 article, anyway. If the island were to become independent, then that money would abruptly stop, meaning that the government has to find another stable source of income. As we've mentioned, there are a lot of natural resources around Greenland, and, as one 2016 news article was headlined, Greenland isn't in a rush to fight climate change, because it's good for the country's economy. Since the 1950s up to 2016, the article explains, the average temperature in Greenland has risen 1.5 degrees Celsius, 34.7 degrees Fahrenheit, compared to an average 0 0.7 degrees Celsius, 33.26 degrees Fahrenheit, in the rest of the world. And between 2011 to 2014, the island lost 1 trillion tonnes of ice. The more the ice melts, the more horrible the world gets, but also the more accessibility the Greenlandic government has to exploit the same sorts of resources that are causing trillions of tonnes of ice to melt, and sink Florida. <laughs> 
And the more the government can exploit these resources, the more it can lay the groundwork for sustainable independence. However, independence would necessitate new allies. So, enter the Chinese government. The Chinese government's interest in Greenland seemingly began in 2005, four years before the island's government gained self-rule, when the Greenlandic premier visited China. In 2011, the Minister of Industry and Natural Resources visited too, before their Chinese government's counterpart visited Greenland in 2012. The new Greenlandic government was enthusiastic about this Chinese government interest, because they offered a source of huge investment into the Greenlandic economy, and a major trade destination for things like the fishing industry. Chinese companies came to have much more presence in resource exploitation in the 2010s, such as mining uranium and thorium. This also brings the EU into the equation, because it's fairly reliant on Chinese companies itself for these sorts of minerals, for use in the weapons industry. As one study explains, exploitation of rare earth elements in Greenland would reduce a significant strategic EU vulnerability. It would bolster its technological sovereignty, the ability to digitalise European armed forces, if the EU had direct access to these rare earth elements. This would ensure a proper implementation of the European Commission's 2020 industrial strategy. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, calls to become less dependent on China are on the rise, and this point may well be taken up more seriously in Brussels now than it was a year ago. The Chinese government and companies have also become more involved in Greenlandic infrastructure since the 2010s. The Chinese government has a policy known as the Belt and Road Initiative, where they sponsor infrastructure development projects in other countries to increase investment and trade to the benefit of that country's economy, and their own. Some people argue that this is a good thing, while others, including many Western governments, argue that it's a way for the Chinese government to increase its global imperialistic power by capturing national economies with debt and giving them access to national infrastructures. The Arctic part of the Belt and Road Initiative is called the Polar Silk Road, and the Chinese government has labelled itself as a near-Arctic state in recent years. Chinese government and corporate activities in Greenlandic infrastructure are regarded by the Danish government as a threat. As one study explains, Danish policymakers are learning that with China, the flag often follows commercial interests. As part of its 2015 Far Seas Protection Strategy, the People's Liberation Army's navy intends to expand its global presence alongside China's Global Connectivity Initiative, the Belt and Road, in which the Arctic region is included as the Polar Silk Road. China's Major General Wang Weizing acknowledges that Chinese commercial infrastructure overseas can act as an effective lever to secure access for new Chinese military bases. Chinese military leaders are putting forward the idea of places without bases, stating that the PLA should exploit Chinese-operated ports and airports if the need arises in future conflicts. China is also a potential security risk to critical infrastructure in Denmark. It is a leading source of intellectual property theft, and, along with other big powers, has the capabilities to eavesdrop and launch disruptive cyber attacks. The point about naval bases is backed up by the fact that a Hong Kong-based company tried to buy an abandoned one in 2016, leading the Danish government to step in and stop the deal from taking place. When Chinese corporations tried to invest in numerous Greenlandic airports and the air transport sector in 2018, the Danish government again intervened. The Chinese government has also shown interest in the past in increasing their polar research presence in the Arctic, the stations for which are also useful for military satellites. In 2016, the Greenlandic government made an agreement with the Chinese government for such a station. This whole situation has not only concerned the Danish government, but also the US government, who regard the rising power of the Chinese government as a threat to their own. The US government, for instance, which owns Tool Air Force Base in northern Greenland, took Chinese government interest on the island as a sign that they needed to work closer with their regional allies, and invest in re-establishing a consulate on Greenland. In 2019, US President Donald Trump announced his intention to buy Greenland in line with these concerns about growing Chinese government influence. President Truman had also considered buying Greenland in 1946 to defend North America against Soviet government strategic bombers. 
The Canadian government, though, has seen more room for cooperation. One subject of note that I've read in one analysis is the Northwest Passage, which the Canadian government claims sovereignty over, but the US government claims is international waters and so cannot be strongly regulated by the Canadian government. The analysis predicted that the Canadian government would actually find an ally on its side of the debate in the Chinese government, in large part because of a dispute over the Cheongju Strait between mainland China and Hainan Island. The Chinese government claims total sovereignty over this waterway, but the US government claims that it's international waters and so cannot be strongly regulated by the Chinese government. As the analysis explained, if the Chinese government were to oppose the Canadian government's sovereignty claims over the Northwest Passage, they'd be open to accusations of hypocrisy, and it would weaken their own claim to the Cheongju Strait. Additionally, as one 2009 foreign policy paper declared, Canada has a strong interest in trade expansion with China, and should now be preparing the way for Chinese, as well as EU, participation in the exploitation of high Arctic natural gas, again with participation from the government of Nunavut. Given present interests and future prospects in Canadian-Chinese Arctic relations, an active effort should now be made to bring China directly into the Arctic region as a steward, and as a new member of the community, rather than have them come in later as intruders, and in a manner that is likely to cause conflict. That's not to say there's no hostility, though. The Chinese government's Arctic presence has still been viewed as a security threat, and, as one paper argued in 2019, Closer defence cooperation with Iceland and Greenland would provide an effective counter to a rising effort of China to influence those two countries. Furthermore, should Greenland move towards independence, an existing and strengthened defence relationship would definitely be in Canada's interest in future. To move away from money-making algorithmic clickbait and return more specifically to the actual subject of the video, the Whiskey War ended this year, 2022, but the actual steps towards that took a very long time. Even after negotiations which took place after the Canadian Defence Minister's 2005 Hans Island visit, which caused a bit of a diplomatic incident. In a later interview, the Minister said that he had made such a high-profile visit because, in the interviewer's words, it was intended to create intrigue around the dispute as a means to win investment in Arctic defence, at a time when there were so many other matters taking up government attentions. He was mostly in favour of the island being shared between the Greenlandic and Canadian governments. You may remember earlier that I said how, in 2008, various governments got together to agree that the Arctic status quo suited them all fine. Well, at that summit it was decided that any territorial issues should be resolved peacefully. The Danish government was one of the principal driving forces behind the summit's declarations, concerned about the potential for increased militarization of the Arctic in future. However, the 2008 meeting didn't end the Whiskey War. In 2012, amid another boundary agreement, the Whiskey War still wasn't ended. In 2018, both sides finally came to an agreement over Hans Island, only for a scientific mission to establish Canadian government sovereignty to be launched in 2019, only for this itself to be ended a few months later. In June 2022, they finally came to an agreement, ending the Whiskey War with what must have apparently been an idea too unthinkably wild to have been done before. Just split the island equally between them. So, what changed for this sudden end to the 40-year dispute to come about? Well, according to the Danish Foreign Minister, it sends a clear signal that it is possible to resolve border disputes in a pragmatic and peaceful way, where all the parties become winners. An important signal now that there is much war and unrest in the world. While this may definitely have come into it, I personally don't think it's the only reason. For one thing, it's not like there wasn't much war and unrest in the world prior to 2022, for the two governments to set an example for. I think we can find another potential reason in an article from 10 years ago about the dispute. As a shrinking polar ice cap opens up a wealth of economic opportunities in the Arctic, Dr. Byers and other researchers say there is new urgency for the Canadian federal government to firmly draw Canada's boundaries. Due to climate change, Arctic temperatures have drastically increased in recent years. In June 2020, it was almost 40 degrees Celsius, 104 degrees Fahrenheit, in a Siberian town. 
The warmer the Arctic gets, the more the permafrost falls. The more the permafrost falls, the more carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, exacerbating the greenhouse gas effect and quickening the rate at which the land ice melts into the sea, which leads to more coastal areas getting flooded. These sorts of temperatures were expected by scientists around the year 2100, not 2020. In 2021, temperatures in Canada got so hot in the summer that perhaps as many as one billion animals died from the heat. As I've already mentioned, the more the Arctic warms up, the more animals and people die, but the more economic opportunities open up for some people and organisations to exploit. The more those opportunities open up, the more interest there is among governments in asserting their regional presence. The more interest there is, the more conflictual they become. Ending the Whiskey War quickly, and securing some level of stable and legitimate sovereignty over the region, as well as for all the national pride and public messaging about conflict resolution, has, at least insofar as I understand it, become a vital security and economic interest. The last thing I want to talk about with the Whiskey War is to argue that it's actually been quite beneficial to the Canadian and Danish governments in terms of public image. I'll focus on the Canadian government out of the two, but many of the same points could be made for the Danish government as well. Across much of the world in the internet, Canada as a country is often seen as a nation filled with extremely friendly, polite and perpetually apologising people, especially so in relation to stereotypes about Americans and this idea is constantly reinforced through memes online. However, Canada is a place like any other with all different types of people, and obviously not all of them fit into this stereotype, because a universal national character doesn't really exist. This stereotype is, however, useful for the Canadian government. For example, when the Russian government invaded Crimea in 2014, the Canada at NATO Twitter account posted a sarcastic tweet about geography, leading to an internet meme that it was Canada's most aggressive act since the War of 1812. The Whiskey War itself is basically just a meme at this point, with many people seeing it as little more than the nicest war in history, or how Canada fights wars, and not as a territorial dispute with wide-reaching nationalist, security, and economic weight. The Whiskey War, then, reinforces the stereotype of the Canadian government that is actually beneficial to it, by potentially allowing it to avoid uncomfortable realities and questions about the actual human cost of its record in the Arctic. I already mentioned the 1950s relocation program earlier, but there is also a much wider and centuries-long genocidal list of policies against the indigenous Inuit nations, actually both in and out the Arctic, such as the highly abusive so-called residential schools, which try to destroy the cultural identity of Inuit people and led to the deaths of thousands of children, many from disease, and which only closed in 1997. Today, Inuit in Canada are often far poorer, and have worse living standards than the average citizen, with little government action to solve it. As the MP for Nunavut, an Inuit herself, wrote in 2021, For all his pretty words, Justin Trudeau and his liberal government have refused to put their money where their mouth is, by adequately funding clean drinking water and survivable housing in Nunavut. Indigenous groups across the country are fed up with his many broken promises and symbolic gestures that mask colonial actions like fighting indigenous children and residential school survivors in court. This is what contemporary colonisation looks like, complacency in the face of indigenous suffering and a refusal to do the bare minimum when it comes to the necessities of life. In the 1970s, the Canadian and Danish governments couldn't come to an agreement over a giant rock in the Arctic called Hans Island, both claiming to have sovereignty over it. This led to a decades-long territorial dispute, where both sides would raise their national flag and leave a bottle of alcohol for the other side when it was their turn to put up their own flag instead, and is known as the Whiskey War. However, the reason why this dispute lasted so long had, in large part, to do with national pride, profit, and security, and is another episode in a rapidly changing region where multiple governments want to stake their claim to land and resources, with an eye on the potential opportunities and dangers 
the future holds.